Una cerveza, por favor. For the last time. Welcome to the pool side of things. My internet is so crappy, ladies and gentlemen, that I have to come to the device that sends the internet. That I am here by the pool. But not bad. I'm not here to be like the badass of this podcast. I'm here to have an internet connection. You had to lower yourself to make the podcast recordings from the pool. <laughs> but, like that's kind of a, the understatement of the year. <laughs> I, I most definitely would not like to be here recording my podcasts down here <laughs> at the pool, but you know, situations being what they are, I had to do this. Yeah, well, poor you. That, that is a I great, know. great attitude to take in an episode where we actually are watching a film about a bunch of Hollywood elitists. <laughs> <laughs> so the stars line up once again. If you haven't seen the show title yet, this is the Flick Lab. Henrik, uh, what, what, what is a flicking lab? Or how did we come up with such a interesting title? Well, we most definitely did not. Oh, the, come on. A collaborative the, effort f- and all f- that. Flick Lab is purely the, your invention as a name. <laughs> I myself was voting for King Harrier. <laughs> I, I still think... Would have been way cooler. <laughs> There's only one problem with this title, marketing-wise. Yeah, I know, I succumbed to the marketing bullshit. But this title doesn't tell what the show is about. So this title, slightly more. It, but it I w- love this alternative title. It would have actually been very fitting for this podcast if we would just have had gone with it and purchased ourselves some rubber suits. <laughs> <laughs> and and may, maybe pay as some masks. <laughs> it might have given the suggestion already what kind of a genre we would be looking into in this podcast. But but can, can you just you know imagine the look on our producer's face <laughs> when he would have started once again bother us about sending him the you know the picture for the front page of the podcast. We can still change it, you know, <laughs> next year and new ideas. Fresh yeah. start. I'm already visioning that one, you know. Yeah. Maybe I should play it as a joke to our producer and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> and mysteriously, all the connections are cut and we never <laughs> hear from him again. <laughs> so, well, King Harrier or The Flick Lab is a movie podcast and we love to go through all kinds of cinema. So we don't want to limit ourselves to a specific genre. So we hop from action to comedy to sci-fi to horror and now to... Mm, what is this movie? It's some kind of a drama. Since we've <laughs> already, you know, crucified you for being an elitist who makes his recordings alongside of a pool and already bad mouth about the producer, <laughs> I guess seeing how today's movie is also about elitists and Heading producers, I think this is a documentary about podcast making. <laughs> I could find so many parallels in this movie. <laughs> the things that we have not only discussed, but what this show has been about behind <laughs> scenes. <laughs> <laughs> At I, least in my mind. I, I deny all <laughs> accusations that I would ever have actually shot an endangered animal. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, we don't hurt animals in this podcast or behind the scenes. Sorry about that. M- m- most no, definitely I'm... not. So, uh, our dear listener, most definitely not FBI. You know, rest easy. <laughs> we should have like a speech. This program has been pre-recorded, and it would say that in this podcast, no animals were harmed. Oh uh, well, I am indeed Kari, and I did study media and. I have taken, honestly, a big break from media. Because you know what? There are certain downsides 
to working in TV related productions and similars like that. So now I'm in Spain working remotely and my field is IT, which I have never studied. My co-host is the person that I lean on to when I have any problem knowing about the history of the actors and stuff. He is my cinephile friend Henrik. And today's movie is White Hunter Black Heart. White Hunter Black Heart. Yeah, title is so great that it merits being repeated twice at the end of the film. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just in case that you bought the ticket to the film and did not realize what is the name of the movie you are watching. <laughs> Today's drinks in the movie sphere is, well, Henrik knows this better, so go ahead. Uh, the names that were dropped were champagne and beer. And alongside of those, there were most definitely different kind of drinks and cocktails that went unnamed throughout the film. I would hazard to guess that they were drinking martinis where, where, you know, when they were taking those casual cocktails yep. in the scenes. But w- once again, you know, that, that's simply a guess I'm making by the glasses they were using. And since we're not in Zambia, I'm drinking the local beer, Amstel Cerveza Original, or I guess with local pronunciation you could go with Original. 100% Malta de Cebada, whatever that means. From 1870. And that's about it, ladies and gentlemen. I have also Coca-Cola. So you have the whole bar there. Pure and yes. Coca-Cola. <laughs> I, on my head, am going with beer. That was easy and name dropped. And today's beer is, well, <laughs> it's Lapinkulta, which has been opened yesterday evening. So it has been lay- laying on my desk, opened. For one day now, I was actually, you know, I always meant to drink this, but God damn it, I managed to pass out before I managed to finish my beer here. So, oh uh, my, yeah, must, <laughs> I, must have been good. I I can only imagine how well this tastes now today. <laughs> <laughs> the reason why we are covering a Clint Eastwood movie today is that. This month, December, there's going to be a new Clint Eastwood movie released in the US and in the rest of the world in January, The Mule. Uh, It's about a 90-year-old horticulturist and World War II veteran who was caught transporting three million worth of cocaine. So we want to remember, well, that sounds again wrong, we want to cover Clint Eastwood because he's current. And in fact, this movie has been, for some time, one of my favorite movies. Spoilers. Reason being, there's really good dialogue here. But let's get to that. I would have just, you know, waited until Clint Eastwood releases his newest film, The Theaters, and reviewed that instead. Just so that we could make all the mean-spirited jokes about how the mule actually explains how Clint has been able to finance his latest movies and also what has actually happened to the thought process behind <laughs> me, behind his directing in, you know, his couple of the latest films he has made. Because god yeah, damn well, has there been a nose dive. Yeah, well, you can do only so many gems, I guess. White Hunter Blackheart is not particularly a well-known Clint Eastwood movie. It just happened by some kind of a random freak accident that I came into touch with this one. But instead of mules, we're going to see some horses in the beginning shots of this movie. Well, this uh, we should give some kind of a synopsis, I suppose, for people who for some reason listen to this podcast before they have seen the movie to get all the spoilers and then watch the movie. So it's about rich Hollywood director who lives in a mansion currently. And or, likes to ride ho- horses in the morning. Yeah, or in-depth Hollywood director since. Also. Yeah, Clint here is actually flat out broke and is living on money he has loaned from somewhere. Regardless, he has an attitude. He, he, he has an attitude of a man who records his podcasts from poolside. 
<laughs> he is a director who has possibly directed for too long to give a damn. Or maybe it's just his nature that he really doesn't care. And he has lucked out and has directed a bunch of movies. But in this current one, he's going to get into trouble for the simple reason of not giving a damn at all and just goes hunting some wild elephants in Africa, completely discarding his crew. Yeah, this is kind of a weird movie to tackle on, because Grint's character is somewhat based on real-life director John Huston and his attitude, and the film itself is based on a book which is, at least for my understanding, haven't read the book myself, it's a fictional account on what happened on the set of a real-life movie, The African Queen. Correct. Yeah, so th- this is kind of a, I don't know, halfway <coughs> fictional narrative of something that partly happened in real life, or something like that. Yeah, it's loosely based on this book. Is I've heard this term loosely. And so this is a movie about a book about... Making a movie. Yeah, fictional book. Because I've come to the understanding that the original book is not an actual account on what happened on the set. Well, in this fictional account, Clint Eastwood's character, John Wilson, is visited by producer Paul Anders, played by George Zunza. Clint, the character John Wilson, wants to direct the next movie in Africa, but he is not in any shape or form interested in directing the movie, he is interested in shooting elephants. And, you know, there's a spice for a conflict in this plot. Yeah, so basically this is a story about one man's obsession. And his obsession dragging the whole film crew along with him. And the film crew kind of uh, trying to force the director to actually make the actual film while the director himself is being driven this obsession to shoot an elephant. Yeah, and seeing this movie for the first time around my early 20s, it somehow totally clicked with the angry young me (laughs) seeing an older character just not giving a flying elephant about anything. I had never seen uh, exactly a movie like this before. Then I got obsessed about finding a similar movie where the lead character just doesn't care and is just being cool as hell doing it. Not particularly when shooting elephants, but that's when it kind of turns. Actually, it's funny because you enjoy Clint's character for being the asshole. But in the end, kind of the also the audience turns around because, you, you know, you have to get this movie done and you can't just discard everybody. And the mood kind of changes in the end. Yeah, it comes to a tragic end on the final minutes. Yeah. Which kind of is not a big surprising exactly how obsessed Clint is being here. Yeah. So we start with uh, Clint on a horse. Uh, then the producer arrives to this mansion. And in this mansion, I would argue that are some of the best lines of this movie. And there's so many of these lines. So many. (laughs) And something that you could use as a life advice. At least for a douchebag like me. I kind of sympathize with this character. Or who doesn't? You can sympathize with him to a point. You can clearly see where he's coming from. But (laughs) first, he's being a, a bit of a hypocrite. Secondly... His antics place in danger in many ways the entire film crew. He ends up toying with the livelihood of others. Yeah, that's where it goes overboard. But in the sense that he completely ignores all the industry bullshit and just gets to the point and says what he thinks, that's great. But also he is so frustrated that he's pushing it too far. Looking at it from an audience perspective, still enjoyable at points. Well, it's enjoyable, it's not, but Clint's character is not something that you should take as a 
role model <laughs> for yourself. <laughs> like, oh. you can find enjoyment in watching assholes, but in the end, Clint is being <clears throat> an asshole. Henrik, would you go with me to Zambia to record some the Flick Lab podcast? Would you dare to do that? Actually, I would. If I would have the financial packing of doing, I most definitely would do it. Simply for the sheer adventure. Be careful what you wish for. And all, all the madness that could come from it. <laughs> well, you probably have seen all of uh, Jeff Fahey's movies. He is known for Lost. Vyat Yerp. No idea how to pronounce that, actually. The Lawnmower Man. And American Dresser. Yeah, and... <laughs> yeah, and most notably, the biggest hit he ever made, Darkman 3. Die, Darkman, die, which was a straight-to-video <laughs> sequel to original Darkman. The, the one sequel where they could no longer actually get Larry Drake to play the character of Robert Durant. <laughs> yeah, handsome man, but maybe the eyes are a little bit uh, too much on the hypnotizing side for me. You know, kind of a, he has this classical... Hollywood look. He looks very like a 60s lead character. To me. He does. Most definitely in this film. But he's also an actor who just kind of faded away at some point. Yeah. Like here he is in a theatrical release playing alongside of Clint and he did in The Long Overman. He was acting against Pierce Brosnan. Although that was Pierce before he hit big with the James Bond franchise. But, you know, Brosnan, nevertheless. And then he kind of finally still got lost into obscurity. Then we have indeed George Junza, German actor. Then we have Charlotte Cornwell. But I believe the stars are limited to Clint, Jeff and George. Pretty much. They are the biggest names in this one. Revisiting this movie, I was surprised how much time they take before they actually shoot the movie. And actually, they don't really shoot the movie at all in this film. It's still like the, well, last frame when they're shooting the actual movie. So this is really all about this character, his mindset, his obsession. And it spends like 21st minutes inside the mansion just cracking awesome one-liners. Then we get to Africa. And there is this... Lady at the dining table causing trouble for Clint. The lady lets everyone know that she has a problem with the Jews. And Jeff Fay, his character, Pete Varil, is not wholly impressed as he is a Jew. And the conflict erupts. And Clint's John Wilson expertly handles the situation with the level of cool rarely seen. He tells a story about a similar incident with a lady on the table. And this is the first serious confrontation of the character. The only moments later, he's about to hit, is it the hotel owner? Yeah, the hotel manager. The hotel manager gets beaten by Clint, but uh, Clint basically loses the fight. <laughs> yeah, it was kind of interesting. Both, both of these scenes are kind of interesting in a, in a sense that here we have Clint Eastwood, American director and actor, who makes... An American film about an American director who flies to Africa to judge the Brits for their racism. Yeah, of course. <laughs> because that's something that uh, I noticed. Clint is very openly against the hostile attitudes towards the Jews. And he, he sides himself with the indigenous people here on the film, and this way he opposes the racist attitude towards the blacks. And all the while doing this, he makes certain never to actually raise an argument about the racism in America. That, that's a topic that's, that is being stayed very quiet about. Mm, why would he have to worry about that when he's in Africa? Well, because this is... Precisely the case, you know. You make completely American film to a core. And then you show that, yep, yeah, these Brits, they sure are racist. 
they sure like their Hitler. Yeah, well. Uh, yeah. Maybe, maybe, but we're talking about individuals, and we're talking about the fifties. Uh, that we are. Not sure if every movie has to make a statement about uh, everything on the group level. I don't know. I mean, in a way, I see this film actually making a statement on a group level. Well, it seems like because there's so many references for defending people against racism, it seems that it's a, some kind of an obsession of Clint to make a point here that, well, he's against racism, he likes to show it off, or maybe he's thinking of the 50s and thinking himself in the situation in the 50s and just wants to kind of <laughs> kick ass off these historical people and their attitudes and show them who's right. It gets beaten up, but he never loses his cool. Next day, it's time to go searching for the elephants with a plane. Pilot pulls a trick. <laughs> yeah, which is later revealed as a trick for Jeff Fahey's character. John Wilson is pulling these kind of pranks and incidents all the time. Next, we're trying the boat on the river which the company absolutely doesn't want to use in this film. And of course Clint disagrees with John Wilson and they go for a test ride and almost get eaten by the waterfall. And that's one of the few moments where you see John Wilson kind of losing his cool. Or not losing his cool, he... That's the rare moments where you see him terrified of something or distracted by something. I never got that he was terrified or distracted in this scene. Well, he saw that they're going to be sucked by the waterfall and looks like nobody else noticed this fact. And he expertly gets everyone to safety <laughs> at the last moments. <clears throat> yeah, the look on his, yeah, the look I, on his face is terror or horror. I kind of uh, read that expression that as that he was simply kind of a marveling the power of the nature at that point. Because in many ways he's still at the control of the situation. Yeah, or he wants to give the impression that he is in control of the situation and doesn't say anything about the waterfall, simply turns the ship around. Yeah, that, that he does. But again, he has no trouble in getting them safety at that point. Had he gone further along the river, he would not have been able to escape the waterfall. He would have been sucked into it and had to take the dive. But at the point where he reacts, he still has the able time to actually stop the whole ride and make it appear that there was never any danger. So in many ways, he's still completely in control of the situation at that time. You know, I believe there's a similar situation with, in uh, a children's TV series around the world with Willy Fogg, where they face the waterfall, and at the final moments they are saved, but I believe it's the <laughs> character transfer that, that gets eaten up by the waterfall, but still, of course, survives. That still to this day holds up. One of my favorite things from the childhood, and still a fantastic series, animated series. I don't remember the show well at all, enough to actually have an opinion on it these days. I was always more of a He-Man kind of a guy. <laughs> okay, I didn't watch those. I did watch DuckTales, and uh, is it Shadow Duck in English? Vario Anka. Darkwing Duck. Darkwing Duck. And James Bond Jr., of course, which was pretty terrible. Yeah, I watched the first episode and never checked it out again. The thing with the boat is that they could have been swallowed by the river at any point. It, the situation definitely looked like that. Everybody else was terrified, but Clint was, or John Wilson was, enjoying the situation. And uh, that's the state of affairs. I don't think he cares in any capacity, at least about himself. And apparently not even about the others. Or he is incredibly brave or incredibly ill-advised to think that this could be a good idea. To me... Too damn determined. To me, he was incredibly vain. Like, the entire trip to Africa mostly is an attempt for Wilson to live this life of an adventurer 
and excitement and to be surrounded by some people who would still admire him since at the home soil he was already getting a bad name his financial situation was if not already discussed at the open it most likely was becoming public or well known at the professional circles and also his his reputation as being a difficult man to work with was catching up to him and in here here in Africa he would be able to kind of surround himself with with people who do not know him yet and who at times seem to admire him for simply because he's a white hunter and the whole trip to Africa at least to me reads like John Wilson just tries to escape the reality that awaits him at the home side into this kind of a fictional life of an adventurer. Yeah, he's escaping his loans perhaps and or that's and he's also escaping his own film that could be making him money to maybe to get him out of this tough situation. But he just clearly doesn't care. That happens to the best of us. So he himself in his own words said that he would probably die in some uninteresting flat somewhere in the middle of nowhere or something along those lines. So he he does not hold any illusions about himself at the same time. He's having fun while he's still able to have it. Yeah, to me he's actually having illusions about himself when he's in Africa. When he goes to Africa, he kind of uh, lets himself succumb in this bubble where he no longer has to, to think about his finances, his professional circles, where he might end up in, in a few years. You know, that that cheap flat where he's, according to his own words, he's going to die laughing at every fool who is still in the business. While he's in Africa, he's kind of outside of <coughs> all of that. He's being this great white hunter who just looks for the big game yeah and he's not the same person in africa that he's back home we could say that this is pure escapism for the character to me it is pure escapism for john wilson henrik how do you perform escapism of your own what do you mean how do you get your head out of the reality of life I'm not sure anymore. It used to be movies and video games and books and basically any form of narrative. But I I don't know. I guess they still work, at least for a while, or into a limit. But at the same time, you know, the troubles you have to face at this point of life are getting too heavy and too big to so that you could ever actually truly escape from them anymore. So you're trying your best to become the boring adult. <laughs> I I can't help it at this point, unfortunately. Yeah. Like maybe no. I too would have to go to Zambia to hunt endangered animals to tr- truly be able to escape the troubles of everyday life. I know what you can do. You can hunt for endangered tofus. But, you know, doing that you would be missing the excitement of committing the ultimate sin, as Clint puts it here. What do you mean? You you don't get excitement of uh, ripping soybeans? Well, do you get excitement out of slicing tofu? (laughs) (laughs) Come on. This is the point where the mirror is facing you. (laughs) I'm I'm asking the question as the <laughs> well uh, yeah I'm just trying to be a better character than John Wilson here failing miserably yeah those are the tricky waters where you get into when you start to a- ask real questions like how do you as a as a real person escape your troubles I escape them by excessive hedonism I like movies but on the whole actually I took kind of a long break at some point from movies because 
I started to lose the point of why am I escaping reality and looking for these artificially built up stories by a few people when I could actually read about reality, which is already fascinating as is. So I'm the kind of person who really prefers to read non-fiction books instead of fiction. So it might take me a long time to get any kind of a book that is complete fiction because I cannot escape in my head the fact that now I have to spend however many hours just in one person's or a few people's head who decided that this is the reality. And, you know, it's like listening to one person for hours. (laughs) Sure, it can be a great story, but life gets a little twisted if you know more about the world that does not exist instead of the one that you are occupying at the moment. Yeah. But sure, sometimes I need my flying cars and bullets and explosions. Or just White Hunter Black Heart. Yeah, this is the kind of shit that you don't say in a movie podcast. But there you go. There was a moment outside where Jeff Fahey's character introduces a part of the script, reads the parts of the script to John Wilson. I believe it's around this moment when there's a fly. Or is it Jeff Fahey who hits the fly? <laughs> it was mixed in such a way that when I was listening it through my earphones, I slapped myself. Why is John Wilson's character coughing all the time? Is it just the hot air? Hmm. Mm, I took it so that he's actually getting ill on the set stuff, or that the hunting is taking its toll on him and with his health. But yeah, the coughing is something that nobody ever actually makes a note about. It escalates and gets worse as the film goes on, but nobody ever notices it, even though you know, his health starting to act up like that while he's supposed to actually make a movie would be a pretty big deal to everyone who has financed the making of the film. I took a notice how it's not explained from the beginning why John Wilson is making such good friends with Kivu. We just see Kivu and then Wilson tells that this guy is a really good dude. But then uh, later we see how it develops. He immensely helps his hunting and in the end goes even as far to sacrificing himself for freaking John Wilson. Yeah. He completely runs towards the raging elephant instead of doing something incredibly stupid like running away from a raging elephant. Yeah. I mean, there were... A lot of trees in this environment. Are you saying that you can't climb a tree or you can't hide behind a tree when there's this kind of, well, elephant, heavy animal who may be slightly limited in his movements in a way that he would not probably be able to hit these people. Where are they hiding behind a tree? But what do I know? I haven't been hunting elephants. Yeah, well, you know, to give my amateur's assessment of the situation, I would say that, you know, backing the fuck off from that situation would be kind of the first thing to do. Like the moment you notice that there is the baby elephant nearby, that's the moment when you immediately start to evacuate yourself from the premises. Hmm. Instead, the whole hunting party just stays there, doing absolutely fucking nothing and stares at the air, agitating the elephant, and then when the elephant starts its attack or starts coming towards the group for the second time, then Kibu just decides that the smartest thing to do at this point is just run towards the elephant, waving your hands and shouting loudly. Don't disrespect his culture. Maybe his culture is to sacrifice himself to an elephant at the slightest point of agitated elephant. He's he's actually sacrificing himself for the great white man who has come from a far off land to middle of Africa to actually shoot fair animals just for the kicks of it. I can see it. I can see it because (laughs) 
John Wilson's character is so friendly to Kivu, which, judging from the hotel incident, could be said that is something of a rare thing. But Kivu is a modest man. Modest man. He's not even sure if he wants to go to the United States to do, I don't know, what the heck. Probably not shooting elephants or helping to shoot elephants. But he really just seems to enjoy John Wilson's company. I can see why, or I can, well, I can find an excuse for Kivu doing that. And I can also see why the villagers can blame John Wilson's character wholly for the incident, because they weren't there. So he's the white hunter with the black heart. But uh, it's maybe a slightly convenient to tie the ending like this. You don't say! But again, it's not because I can see John Wilson blaming himself for the incident, and I can see the villagers blaming him, but just... <laughs> yeah, it doesn't make sense to run against an elephant. But don't disrespect his culture. You never know. I'm I'm not disrespecting his culture. I'm purely disrespecting the logics at play here. Yeah, maybe it should have been fleshed out a little more to give a better explanation why he's doing it. Something like maybe Kivu thinks John Wilson is literally some kind of a god. Or something like that to make such a sacrifice where actually it wasn't in entirely clear if sacrifice was needed. But Kivu definitely thought so. And who am I to judge? Again, I haven't been hunting elephants. Maybe the best course of action is just actually run against the elephant and kill yourself. Yeah, but you know, my main issue with the whole ending scene of the film is that the whole group, including Wilson, are acting like complete jackasses in that moment. Like, you already almost got yourself run over by an elephant, which you could not shoot at that final moment. Because that, that's basically what leads into the second attack from the great task that John Wilson is so fucking obsessed about. The elephant attacks John Wilson when John Wilson is simply hunting it. And at that point, John Wilson cannot pull the trigger. And the situation kind of resolves itself. And like 10 seconds after that, they clearly notice that the elephant has a baby nearby. And, you know, that should be the moment when a logical man takes the fucking cue and starts to back off. Like, that that should be something that, that should be implemented in the backbone of John Wilson and everybody else in that situation. You know, you back off at that point. Instead, they all just hang around there standing stupid like fucking jackasses. And the great task starts its second attack towards the group. <laughs> and everybody still refuses to fucking back off. And then Kibu just decides that he will run towards the elephant. And even perhaps more mysterious is, why didn't John Wilson try to shoot the elephant at that moment? Yeah, or the second hunter, who was kind of a yeah. touring with Kibu to these locations and acting as his guide. Yeah. It seemed that there were plenty of time to do some kind of a less morbid resolution. Yeah, it almost it kind of a, it almost looks like that someone had read the script and noticed that the film is almost at end, and at this point something fucking has to happen so that John Wilson finally gets his head out of his ass and decides to actually start directing a goddamn movie. Yeah, why do they read so much the script in these movies that we tackle with? How about this? The elephant starts its attack. Either John Wilson or the other hunter raise the gun. They shoot the elephant just before it's about to attack Kivu. And perhaps at, the, at this moment John Wilson would notice the futility of his brainless sport. And perhaps Kivu would be injured in some way, at something like that. Well, he gets to kill the elephant, and then he notices that it wasn't really worth it. Yeah, I don't know, maybe that doesn't work. Yeah, I mean, in the end, yeah, this is the kind of a movie that requires that there has to be a tragedy at the end of it. Like, John Wilson, in some way, 
has to lose his moral standing. Careful what you're saying. Are you saying that he doesn't lose his moral standing when an elephant is killed? Are you saying that the movie doesn't get its uh, grim resolution with killing an elephant? Uh, uh, uh. I I'm saying that killing an elephant would not have been big enough a deal for John Wilson to finally start directing the movie. Yeah. Because had John Wilson made to kill the elephant, it would have kind of been a futile success for his obsession. It would have still been a senseless crime that even John Wilson admittedly would not understand why he has to do it, as he states in the film, but he would have still achieved his goal and could have walked away from the whole situation with yeah there was no point in shooting an elephant but I still managed to do that and feel good about himself in that way but the way how the film ends it comes clear to John Wilson that his obsession has had a collateral damage and it highlights to him exactly how much his obsession can cause to everyone else because His actions here on the film, they do not only harm himself, but they harm basically everyone else who is tied into him through this film project. The more baffling mystery in this film is that they leave Kivu, Kivu's body, to the scene of death. Yep. Now, what's that about, though? Are they saying that there wasn't enough space for a corpse in the car now? Or will they pick him up later? Or they will just leave him rotting there? Or it's some kind of a religious logic in the village. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that at that point, the two white men on a hunting trip just noticed that the one who died is just some black guy and left I just, left the corpse there. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting from it. Even John Wilson didn't care at that moment. Yeah, the John Wilson, the... Humanitarian. Yeah, the great humanitarian, the opposer of racism, <laughs> just takes a notice that, oh yeah, it was a black guy. Not worth the effort to carry the body back to the village so that he could be given a proper burial. Nice one. Yep, where to go? I realized my earlier oxymoron, not to piss off anybody, but religious logic may be one. I'm not taking this page. <laughs> I know you still belong to church, so enough said. Perhaps also baffling how Jeff Fahey's character is lured in to the car by John Wilson by just saying that oh, there might be something happening that might be scary or something like that. And then he takes the bait and jumps into the car and throws his script. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That didn't seem believable. Was kind of a jerky way to get him to the final scene. Yeah, Fahey kind of turns completely 180 degrees at that point. Where he has, yeah, was... yeah previously he's been this extremely careful kind of guy. Trying not to take any unnecessary risks. And then finally when, you know, John Wilson just makes the notion that, oh yeah, risks might be upcoming the way. He immediately jumps at the chance. Indeed. It's sort of chilly here in Spain, believe it or not. Uh, let's check the Zimbabwe weather. 33 degrees. Cloudy. Yeah, let's go to Zimbabwe. If you are paying for the shotguns, sure, why not? Then we can get rich by shooting endangered animals. I, I've, I've heard there is a great market for, you know, elephant bones and tasks. I heard there's hefty prison sentences for these people as well. Yeah, but you know, it would be kind of a John Wilson adventure time. There's an idea for a virtual reality video game of this movie. See, there you go. Once again, you know, I actually try to advocate here for us dressing like the old British colonialists and Turning to Africa to shoot elephants and sell their tasks at the black market and and in the face of adventure and life-changing events, you are starting to back off and 
just advocate for a virtual reality video game. Like... As no elephants would be harmed. Would Clint Eastwood ever make a movie out of you? <clears throat> Who knows? No, to be, to be honest, I've seen some pretty crazy shit on these trips. And life abroad. So, Clint Eastwood, if you're available, let's do one final movie. I have now just found out that it looks like the airport that is featured in the movie, which I thought was completely made up and doesn't exist, Entebbe Airport. It's not fictional, but it's not in Zimbabwe either. It's in Uganda. And if we check the credits... Yeah, I don't see Uganda as a filming place. I see Zimbabwe, UK, UK, Zimbabwe, UK, UK. And actually also Zambia. So I wasn't completely wrong about that either. Henrik, what's your favorite performance in White Hunter Blackheart? It still hands down has to be Clint's performance. Same here. Yeah, he's, he's the tour de force actor in this film, even though there is a lot of good performances, but Clint still kind of overpowers the entire film. Absolutely. Yeah, this is most notably a Clint Eastwood feature. He certainly prepared for this role in many ways. Uh, the delivery is fantastic. Yeah, and He has this fr- certain frustration in his voice or his intonation that is going there all the time. He's speaking like, well, I just might go to the bar and ignore all of you. It's, yeah, it's easy to see how this rude, easy to fight, kind of a hard-nosed and harder going his own way director was something that Clint Eastwood most definitely wanted to play. Well, here's your scissors, Henrik. What would you cut? What would you improve? I actually don't don't completely know. I mean, the mo- main thing that kind of distracted me during viewing of this film was is the fact that it kind of intercuts between two storylines. There is the White Hunter aspect, the main storyline, Wilson's obsession, but there is also at times given point to these strategical problems when it comes to making the film they are about to make. Most notably, the one scene where one of the technical members of the film crew is explaining to Wilson how Wilson will need two, possibly three cameras for some fire sequence, which they are about to shoot at some point in the filmmaking process. And that kind of a jumping between two elements of a storyline one about the obsession and the one about the difficulties of making a film in Africa. That was something that I I would have wished that the film would have 100% and completely kind of tied itself into either one of those. So either be completely about the obsession and forget about the talk about the mechanical aspects of filmmaking in Africa or then make a film completely about shooting a film in Africa. So you're saying that this movie should have taken John Wilson's own advice that they should concentrate on only kind of one certain plot point instead of several. Now that you mention it, yeah, you know, like John Wilson says here in the film, keep it simple. I didn't get this problem and I also feel that you kind of have to switch between some plot points too. With this story structure, you kind of have to carry the, the we are going to shoot the film in Africa mentality and idea behind the scenes. Since the storyline is Wilson using the film project to finance his hunting trip and his hunting obsession. So of course, yeah, this, well, we are making a film, has to be kind of a carried over throughout the film throughout the story but it still kind of uh, bugged me especially during those scenes when they were so much trying to be about discussing about how they are going to shoot the film and what they need for this one scene hmm i didn't get that except it was a kind of a lure to get wilson's character to for example to try the boat which gives more meat to his character once again but um 
I noticed and I kind of always felt that the last 40 minutes or so are getting uh, slightly repetitious in the sense that again we see John Wilson's character giving a hard time this obscenities or breaking the etiquette when talking to his colleagues and we've seen that already like uh, 20 times which is still entertaining however when it gets to the savannah the when they're hunting the elephant I felt that it slows down a little tiny bit and that the movie could have been somehow tighter hard, very hard to specify how but perhaps the movie is a little too long in the middle yeah the pacing of the movie or, or the flow of the story really does get a bit slower on the second yeah. half of the film I mean it has a fantastic first act and even though it doesn't move from the locations fast enough you're really enjoying the dialogue and the confrontations but yeah, it's funny they spend a lot of time outside of Africa first which is where I feel the movie is at its strongest and once it gets to the second half of the Africa it's it needs a kick in the ass I'm with you on this one. I I kind of felt that the first half of the film is better than the second half. Yeah. And I too can't exactly put into words what happens. Like, what is the exact mistake they kind of make? Why, why the second half feels inferior to the first half? The repetition is one thing that hurts the second half. For me... The jumping around between the are we gonna just hunt down the elephant or are we gonna make a film started to nag around the, the second half of the film and yeah yeah the pacing does get a bit slower and none of those alone are any big failures or big faults from the film side but I guess that when you combine all of them it kind of creates this feeling that You kind of have already seen it and you kind of already know where the film is going to head. And you are, as a viewer, you are kind of one step ahead of the film during the second half. And maybe that's why the first half feels so much stronger. Hmm, in the first half you're waiting for them to make the move to come to Africa. And indeed Africa, you you at least know that he wants to hunt for the elephants, but... Then what? Maybe it becomes a sort of a standstill in the plot somewhere around when he's hunting and then then it gets interesting when the film crew arrives and you get that conflict. But slightly perhaps after that, there's a little lull there. But not a, not a huge problem. Not at all. But maybe there is... No, it, it is necessary to change the mood at the end. Like the first half is, let's say... You're just laughing along with the smart quips of John Wilson. In the second half, you stop rooting for him on some level. And there's this mood switch, which is completely unavoidable in this story. But yeah, you start to look at it from the John Wilson entertainment perspective, where he's making fun of everyone. And then it's um something else. Yeah, if I would have to point a finger at at a certain point of the film i would guess that it's one hour and 15 or one hour and 20 minute mark where i kind of got the sensation that okay now we are on the weaker part of the film like i was with the movie 100 percent i guess somewhere around where they first see the elephants but yeah yeah, yeah but but sometime after that scene film finally started to for me it started to feel like the film kind of started to drag yeah so we agree that around somewhere in the 20 to 40 last minute there is as a little lull yeah and it's kind of an odd notion to make about this film when you look at what type of story this film is aiming to tell you mean that the movie has an element to be a very tight and interesting movie throughout i i mean that in a way, 
the story of the film limits itself to kind of follow the exact path that we are now criticizing. Because story-wise, there are not that many roads that the film could have taken. In its core, the film is solely about John Wilson's obsession. And the cause that his obsession has to everyone else. Since the story kind of works in a such of a tight environment where there are not that many different locations where it takes place and since the story is kind of a so grounded there is there is not many routes that it could take like it has to be John Wilson's obsession hurting the film crew then talks about how close to the line the whole film process is going to come and someone trying to talk Wilson out of his obsession and then the final moments where something has to go terribly wrong for Wilson finally open his eyes. And that's not that many building blocks that you get with those plot beats, but those are the plot beats you have to take with this story. And we watch this film acknowledging all of this and kind of a the two of us have to be kind of a fine with this, since we know the film genre we are looking at, and we see these plot mechanics behind the movie. And yet still, somehow, in here, with all this hindsight that the two of us possess, it still somehow feels like, like the film is dragging, and that the last 40 minutes are weaker than the movie before them. Yeah, but I think it also reflects in the reviews a bit, all the average that you see in IMDb. Like, something happens, and it would be interesting to dive into 1990 and see the people in the editing booth, like, wondering, like, okay, I have put this together, and I just don't get it. Like, it has some problem in the last minutes, but I don't know why. I just can't... I just can't understand this. Clint, help me out. And Clint is completely clueless as well. Okay, just let's release this. And that's kind of a... Now that you mention it, that's kind of a how it feels. Like, like, this feels a movie where the shooting has felt really strong and they finish the shooting really feeling good about what they have shot. And then at the editing booth, they notice that something is amiss, but they can't quite point the finger at what they should either put in or cut out to make it work. Yeah. And after that, Clint just kind of uh, gives his decision that, you know, at this point we stop messing with the editing. This is the final form of the film. Just put it in can and just release it. Because we all kind of uh, have to move on to the next project. And we can move on to the next category. And I will never give this category up. Seems like it. So yeah, what is your favorite kill scene? <laughs> I guess my <laughs> favorite kill scene in this film is the moment when Kivu's death completely kills Wilson's ego. <laughs> okay, I will name name the weakest moment in this movie, but also I do not know how to replace that. Or you know, I I think it's still in some way needed. When at the end John Wilson comes to Pete and says to him that you were right you were right about the ending and right after the death uh, right after arriving back to the village right after getting out of the car then saying this line and then directly going to the director's seat <sighs> not enough time has passed in between these moments it's a little pushed in there i get the feeling yeah to me though on the other hand that was my favorite scene Mm -hmm. Not that dialogue drop alone, but the entire scene, you know, Yeah. when Wilson returns to village. Or that scene starting from Wilson returning to village and ending with him giving the signal that they are starting to film. That's my favorite scene in this film. And gives a mellow action. Gives a mellow action. Which nobody can hear. Hey, what? What? What did he say? Yeah, but I, I guess at that point everyone has read the script and knows that now we have to start acting. <laughs> if I direct any more stupid homemade movies, I will start using this. 
Action. Yeah, I'm just waving your finger around to show you guys that the camera should <laughs> start rolling. But yeah, that's... It's kind of a heartbreaking scene. Even with all the problems I've had with Wilson as a character, not in a way that Wilson's character is a bad one, but in a way that John Wilson is a selfish asshole throughout the film, but still kind of seeing him finally having to open his eyes and losing this fantasy that he has built himself and just, well, finally becoming a director for this film. There is still quite much pain that you can see in Wilson on that moment. And you still kind of feel bad for the guy. Maybe the slight tone shift is about uh, what you get from the attitude of John Wilson in the beginning, because sure, he's a selfish asshole, but uh, let's say the uh, the first 20-30 minutes, he's also very practical. Just goes full on ahead through all the industry nonsense and the obnoxious people also being obnoxious himself, but he's also very practical. But it, when it gets to the half mark, at least, then uh, the asshole side weighs more than the practical side. And actually, he loses the practical side completely because he's just hunting animals. I don't know about that, because that was not my take on Wilson in any part of the film. Maybe it's just because of the fact that I'm a selfish asshole myself. So I've heard anyway <laughs> from <laughs> uh, <clears throat> ex-partners. But that always gives you a twisted picture of the reality, right? And you you cannot go to your exes and ask them what they think about you. You would go nuts. Then again, I'm not really. After being in <laughs> customer service for so long, <laughs> you know, I'm just completely immune for all the accusations. <laughs> Bad mouthing. My favorite scene is kind of everything that you have in the house in the beginning. That's kind <clears> of a big scene, I must point out. Yeah, um, if I would have to choose something, I would choose the moment when they're <laughs> spending time with this woman who wants to explain about her own script. There is some um, sexist bullshit there as well, but when it's not sexist bullshit, it's it's quite funny. And also when the producer arrives to the property. Yeah. Favorite quote. Oh boy. Oh boy. Where should I start? I think I'm just going to go through all of these quotes that I picked up and let's see what is the most resonating one. Pete says, you really think that's going to help me? Whatever it was. Wilson says, even if it doesn't, you've got to do it. There are times when you can't wonder whether it's the right or wrong thing to do. Not for guys like you and me, kid. You just got to pack up and go. Yep. That fits my traveler outlook. Or Pete says, $300,000, John, and you're not worried? Wilson responds, oh, I think about it now and then. (laughs) That kind of sums up the atmosphere of this movie. Or when he's talking about the producer. And you know why I agreed to work with him again? Because it's the wrong thing to do. Actually, I have no idea what he means here. (laughs) And That's one of the biggest problems in, in the movie or conflicts in the movie that he picks this producer that he doesn't like at all. But then again, by choosing him, the story is able to tell about the character of Wilson through these characters. Yeah, well, Wilson appears as a person who does not like basically anyone in the filmmaking business. Yeah. Like, that's one of the major things with Wilson. And this is something where Wilson kind of doubles down in the film. Wilson... (laughs) <laughs> makes it repeatedly perfectly clear that he kind of despises anyone. He he hates the producer, he hates the Brits, who are kind of throwing the money to make the film, most likely doesn't even like the actors. And yet, when the character of Ralph Lockhart makes the notion of Hollywood hunting, that's the point when Wilson all of a sudden gets extremely protective of Hollywood and people working in Hollywood <coughs> making this uh, this speech about horse of Hollywood and how it's the horse who give Hollywood a bad name and he does this even though he himself is one of the very horse in this film since he's living off his debt and even though he makes the claim that his hustling days are behind him 
well, basically the whole movie project together is is just him hustling and cheating ways to finance his hunting trip. This is obviously not interested in the movie project at all. Some other good quotes. So I don't care if this picture is shot in black and white or sepia tone, or we have to make the whole damn thing in animation. Pete and I are going to Africa. And there's the fighting scene. The hotel owner says, I'm not supposed to fight with the guests, Mr. Wilson. And Wilson in response, I'm not a guest tonight, you yellow bastard. I happen to be an intruder. That's, yeah, that's a quote which would not have flowed <laughs> nearly as well had the other guy been an Asian. Exactly. Or, you gotta fight when you think it's the right thing to do. Otherwise, you feel like your gut's full of pus. What was your quote? I would have to go with the speech that John gives at the 115 minute mark about his obsession. How he himself either can't understand his need to shoot the elephant, (laughs) but how he still has to do it because it's a sin. Yeah, it's the one moment where he admits that it doesn't make any sense. That it is. It's the kind of a moment of clarity for him. Yeah. When you think of this movie, what's the first image that comes to mind? I would guess it's uh, it's the look on John's face at the <clears throat> very end of the film when he is aiming at the great task with his with his shotgun and can't pull the trigger. Like that close up on his eyes behind the barrel of a gun. Yeah. For me, it's the end scene, when they try to shoot the elephant, but then you see even Wilson backing off and smiling to himself, I think. Yeah, it's hard to tell on that moment. Yeah, he sees the futility of his enterprise right there, which is nice. Yeah, I or, or I, I guess he finally understands that he, in the end, does not have the right to shoot the elephant and not even the man inside of him. Would you recommend White Hunter, Black Heart? Despite all of its problems, yeah, I I still would recommend this film. This was the first time you saw this film, right? Yep. Uh, Watched it for the first time ever this morning, which was, in the end, in hindsight, I guess, a pretty good call, Hmm. since this morning I actually happened to have a quite a hangover, and the movie quite nicely worked as a hangover remedy for me. Me, on my part, I was working so much that uh, I was just cursing on my desktop, just on my laptop, trying to finish my work. There was too much. I was working like 12 hours nonstop, and then I was like, oh my god, I still have to watch this White Hunter Black Heart for the third time in my life. And, And so I did. Somehow, miraculously, I was still able to be up and finished around 7 a.m. in the morning, and then slept, and then woke up to realize, oh, it's uh, 40 minutes to recording, let's get this show on the road. Yeah, that's Amazing. The, that's the dedication here on this podcast. Exactly. And now I have to do the final cleaning for the flat and leave Spain once and for all, because I have received some work from Finland, and believe it or not, the old vagabond, the uh, digital nomad is going back to Finland that he always cursed that he would never go back. But, you know, uh, I guess money somehow talks in this situation. That's the way of the world, kid. Yeah, but uh, Finland has its advantages. When you have spent three years abroad, you get a certain perspective as well. I mean, it was also obvious that Finland is a great place to live, no doubt. But there are problems, but there are definitely different kind of problems elsewhere. They don't disappear. Whatever you do, you can't avoid problems. And, you know, overall, Finland is a pretty damn good country. And it was voted the happiest country in the world. If somebody really puts any, you know, weight to these lists, but nevertheless, yeah, no, okay, that sounds good. And I would also recommend What Hunter Black Heart. It was one of my top movies for a long time. Uh, I see uh, the movie's mistakes, but the dialogue is fantastic. So, mm, yeah, that fact alone and Clint Eastwood's way of delivery is the one that wins this movie for me. Next week, we will have Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence from 1983. Yeah, so... 
a movie that I have not seen, so I'm looking forward to that. Yep. Well, it, it's the Christmas season, so something joyful and lighthearted is definitely needed. And it has Merry Christmas on the title. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. This has been the Flick Lab. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. And if you have any death threats or such, you can send them to the Flick Lab at pm.me. And anything to add here? Or should I close the sanitized doors of the laboratory? From my account, yeah, you can close the doors. We will all see you again next week. Unless we find ourselves, instead of making this podcast, just heading to Africa to shoot endangered animals. Hopefully not. Bueno, hasta luego. Yep, bye, also from here. Okay, you know, this is what you get when you record on the poolside. You splash beer on your screen, so just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Fuck, this is ridiculous. You Google for Barcelona and you just get football. <laughs>